talk, uh, we have the tips that we want to share. Oh, hi, Kathy. Happy holidays to you, too. Um, we have tips that we want to share, but we also want to answer your questions about piecing. And um, we want to hear what challenges, what parts of piecing are challenging for you. Um, oh, and Anne's from Sweden. Great. And, uh, oh, good. I'm glad that you're, <clears throat> Elizabeth is new to streaming. Good. So I hope that you all will um, share your questions about piecing and let us know how we can be helpful to you. We're going to, oh, Bill is here. Hi, Bill, we Bill like to be helpful. <laughs> yes, we do like to be helpful. So um, the first thing I'm going to suggest is that uh, my number one tip is to make a sample block or if it's not a block pattern, to make a part of the quilt before you cut out everything. Oh my gosh, this is so important that basically a little tester. Yeah, because you want to make sure that you understand the technique and that the piece, that, that the pattern is accurate. Our patterns are very accurate and we, we write the pattern and then make the quilt, which is not the norm in our industry. But it does but, lead, in general, to uh, more accurate patterns. And, and mistakes can <clears throat> happen in the writing of a pattern or in the reading of a pattern. Very often, even if we write our own patterns, sometimes we read them wrong as we're doing it. And doing a sample, is, as we said, whether it's a sample block or if there's a new technique to you. You know, we love curves. And curves are something that scares some people. If you're new to curves, before you piece a curve, use some of your scrap fabric, do a couple samples of it, and build up some confidence. So, <clears throat> but I do find that if you make a sample block first, you will, um, you'll be able to make sure that your color work in particular is going to work. And you wanna make that sample block with um, the contrast that you plan to use and then look at it from at least 10 feet away. We've, um, I have a friend who spent years on a quilt and then was really unhappy with it because she hadn't realized until she got farther away um, and she actually took a picture of it that there wasn't sufficient contrast, that she was working at this angle for years. Very close uh, and distance. It, and it looked like it was fine, but as soon as she started as soon as she finished it, she felt really frustrated that the contrast wasn't sufficient and the whole, all of her work was a little lackluster. And, so. and I think that that idea of we know things too well and stop seeing them. So if there is a, a block that you're working with, as Weeks says, our 10 foot rule is always helpful, but also even the fabrics that you're using step away and look at them close up and far away because they yeah. look different. Deanna says it's, she's getting glitchiness on sound. Oh, okay. We've got, we, well, I, I'm looking, our, our stream looks solid here. So yeah. I, I think it might be on your end. Right. Because we just, we just replaced the modem and we got everything all, yeah, yeah. all up to date. So we, it should be good on our end. Um, so that's our first tip. Um, then the second tip is to measure your seam allowance before you start sewing. Um, I have been surprised when I've taught in-person classes that, or even answered questions um, on quilt alongs or that kind of thing, that somebody has been frustrated that a technique or um, a template doesn't fit. And then I say, well, what seam allowance are you using? And they'll say, oh, I don't know. I just, I always make it bigger and just cut it down. And um, that doesn't work with all techniques, that strategy. So and, and actually measure it. I, I like to use this, um, this is a little teeny tiny ruler, but um, anything that can give you, that can slide in there. And um, I'll show you an example. This is, a, so do you see that seam allowance? You really want it finished to be one quarter. So make sure before you sew the whole thing that your seam allowance is right and you might need to move the needle or... Yeah, and that idea of the seam allowance, 
is a tricky thing because remember, your goal is always to enjoy your, well, everyone's goal is different. If your goal is enjoying the quilting and you don't want to obsess over the seam allowance, that's one thing, but you don't want a wonky seam allowance to throw off all your construction and leave you frustrated. So if you're sewing, let's say you're doing a quilt that's full of two inch blocks and your seam allowance is off by a 16th of an inch, you'll think like, gosh, that's nothing. I barely see a 16th of an inch. But if you think a 16th of an inch over and over and over. 16 over, pieces. <laughs> oh, and if it's yeah. two inch block, and let's say it's a queen size quilt, that's suddenly several inches that it adds up to. And it can lead to frustration. So one thing I suggest is say, take two squares that are three inches, sew them together, open it up, and it should be five and a half inches, you'd lose two quarter inches. If it's not, like people, some people measure the seam allowance, but also if you measure the finished block That's once it's point. ironed, that might give you a better indication because you know, when you press seams, it takes up space. Yeah, and you know, we use, um, depending on the technique and some of my uh, video classes, I used a walking foot depending uh, for piecing because sometimes that can be really useful depending on the technique. Um, but if you um, have a Bernina, you uh, know that they have a great walking foot, uh, or not a walking foot, um, quarter inch foot um, that has a little, um, in woodworking they would call it a fence, but it's a little piece that, so you absolutely are guaranteed a quarter inch seam allowance um, because if you, the fabric goes right up against it and it can't get bigger. Um, but there, if you have a machine that doesn't have the option of a quarter inch foot, um, like our uh, featherweight, um, there's a magnetic piece that you can buy at any sewing mm -hmm. supply place that you can put on there. Or a but piece just, of masking tape just to remind yourself just on the throat plate can help. Well, I like the ma the magnetic one because it's actually a physical, physical barrier. wall. So as, as long, long as, you as you're touching pins. the wall, <laughs> yes. you're good. Um, so people are um, giving me uh, in, in the chat information about um, that they're finding different levels of... Um, uh, what resolution or yeah. whatever streaming quality on different devices. We know um, we have double, triple checked. Um, if it, oh, are we having a problem now? Or is Facebook check. having a problem? But um, I'm glad. Oh, and Baby Lock also has the same foot as well. So um, Sue has a question. I recently had to rip out a whole row that I had put on backwards. After doing that, the intersecting seams opened up and I had to re-sew those. Um, any tips on avoiding opening up the intersecting seams when ripping? Oh, and you use my uh, ripping technique. So um, the only suggestion I have, and it would make your ripping a little bit more um, challenging, would be that if you um, shorten your seam allowance a little bit, because if you're ripping out a seam and it's ripping that much of the seam you know if you're ripping out a long seam and then the tops of these um, open up for an inch that tells me that maybe you're um, for the thread you're using and the fabric that you're using maybe your seam your stitching length is a little your stitch length. Just maybe shorten that just a yeah. tiny bit yeah so oh so what is happening with the metrics oh so, my gosh this is so frustrating this may be Facebook here yeah because we we seem to have a very strong connection on our end most of the time so but we're getting um, a some little now it seems to be a little bit better but it looked like it looked like it was one of those uh, emergency room hang in there please yeah it seems to be um, it seems to be fine now right just like a minute ago it looks like we lost some for a minute um, so that seam allowance, uh, be sure to check that and to, um, to check on the, uh, all of that before you start sewing because typically when people are having problems with rows being different lengths or blocks being different sizes, 
it's either a cutting problem or a seam allowance problem. So that brings us to tip number three, three. which is to cut carefully with no more than four layers. So it's so tempting to shortcut. Yeah, to questions. And, um, okay, so we, we just got more stuttering. This is so strange. Oh, this is so frustrating. We have a super high um, stream rate on our end. So let me just see, we're trying to see whether or not to just do a quick restart. Yeah. Oh, it's I this really love like, being able to do the live streaming, but it's stop this stream and come back on. Should we try that? We, we can try that really quickly. If okay. All right. So we will... Um, we'll just reconnect quickly. Yeah, but we'll, we'll be right back. Right back. Let's see if we can get a better... Oh, oh. Now, now somebody's saying it's better now. Okay. Oh. <sighs> can, can some of the those of you who are also having problems, are you finding it better now, or do we need to uh, stop the stream? you can let us know, we'd appreciate it. Oh, okay, working fine? Great. Okay. Okay, because it says on our end that it's fine. And okay. one of the things we've learned is with streaming lately, all of the internet service providers are just kind of overburdened. Well, so, and also it's really it's, dramatically different depending on where you are. Where you are. Yeah. Yeah, and we can see that it's going out okay from our end, yeah. but we don't know what's happening. Right. So, as for anyone who's, if you're getting frustrated, we do record it and it will be on our YouTube channel or on Facebook, the replay will be smooth later. So yeah, we, what, we understand is, the frustration. Elizabeth's um, uh, suggestion to turn the flip phone to airplane mode so it's not stealing from your Wi-Fi. Yeah, I think it, it just sort of depends on, uh, depends on where you are. Yeah. And what device you're looking at it on. Okay, yeah. good. I'm glad. We're, we're hardwired to the internet here. Yes. Yeah, so so we, anyway. We we'll, shouldn't we'll, have any Wi-Fi interruption. We'll go back to that cutting. And Weeks was talking about don't shortcut things on your cutting. It's really tempting if your pattern calls for two-inch squares to stack up eight pieces. And, you know, the rotary cutter will go through a dozen pieces of fabric, but they'll shift. So we limit our cutting to four layers at a time just to avoid what's called creep of, of the movement. Yeah, and so um, the even I've seen it sometimes in classes where um, people look, I don't want to say distracted, but they are, they are uh, they're cutting without looking where they're cutting, which also is a little scary, scary. to me. <laughs> we like um, our fingertips. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But um, definitely, you know, the, the whole quilting process, I kind of think of it like debt that has compound interest that you start. It's a great analogy. When you, if, you, if you don't pay attention cutting, the mistakes and the frustration. It just gets worse at every step. That if you make a mistake basting your, uh, well, no, let me see. If you make a mistake um, putting your binding on, you just rip off the binding and then you can that's put it the back last on, step. right? And even if you're sewing rows and the rows don't align at the very end, you rip out one row. But if you don't cut accurately, you're going to be fighting the entire process. So, and that took me a while to learn when I was starting out. I, I think that's really, that's key. Because if your cutting is off by a sixteenth of an inch, and then your piecing is off by a sixteenth, and that's an eighth, and then you put two pieces together, and that's suddenly a quarter, and we're not perfectionists by any means. We, we, as I say, we want you to enjoy this. Yeah. But if you can figure out, like if you know that cutting isn't your thing and you tend to hurry through that, maybe if you slow down just a bit, even if it's not what you love to do, if you slow down, it might make what comes later more enjoyable. And if you're dealing with templates, if you have a magazine or a pattern that you have to copy the template, make sure you copy and cut the template out right, because even that will make a difference. And if you're... Oh, I'm if glad, you're, sorry, Sue. I'm glad I saw that you love the new non-slip rulers uh, we have. Me too. 
and this has a lot to do with things because this is, uh, this is like the trimming ruler. This is my favorite. We we went through um, prototyping different surfaces because for me, if a ruler slips, you're going to make a ton of cuts. But if the, if it's too grippy, mm -hmm. you you can't fine tune it when you line things up and you end up shifting the fabric. So we wanted to find a surface that you can adjust and fine tune without moving the fabric, but when you put the least bit of pressure on, it grips. But we also love the numbering. Can you see that it has, it's blurry, the five and a half and six and a half, and that actually the, the actual measurements are, it doesn't just say half, half, which I think is easier when you're dealing with a lot of repetitive cutting. Yeah, I, I think one of the things is, Quilters are smart people. You know, you're making really intricate things, but sometimes when you're following directions, your mind is trying to remember measurements. You're trying to look at the measurements on your cutting board and on the ruler. And it's kind of like this cascade of numbers. So on our rulers, we really tried to make clear, easy to read um, measurements because you just like make everything a little easier. Okay. So tip number four. Oh, and this is, is um, big, 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 big. <laughs> um, be mindful of where you put your pins. This is, it sounds like such an obvious thing, but I, I see it um, online and in workshops where people, they, they'll put a pin there. Just, um, and that is not, where the sewing line is going to be. So if you make it a habit to insert your pin one quarter of an inch from the raw edge, so where, gonna, where the sewing line is going to be. Right where the pin goes in should be right where that seam allowance is going to get sewn. The what it doesn't matter where you what happens beyond that quarter of an inch line that's parallel to your raw edge because what all that all that you're going to see in that block is the what happened at the quarter inch mark because that's where the seam is going to be so if you want your blocks to come out the way and you want um, uh, points to match, you need to pin where the needle is going to go on your sewing machine. Yeah. If, does that so make sense? We always visualize where that seam is and make sure yeah. the points, the pins. One more. Yeah. And make sure that the pins are inserted at that quarter inch mark because that's the point you want to anchor. I can even draw that. that. Do you want me to draw that on? That's okay. Oh, okay. So, um, pinning is, I can't, I can't uh, overstate how helpful it is I, to I pin think accurately. If you think that the point of the pins is just to hold the blocks together while you sew, that's different. We think of the pins as precisely positioning the blocks for the sewing. Anchoring Which is them. Anchoring them. Yeah. And you're anchoring them exactly where that sewing line is going to be. So quilters are good at visualizing a quarter of an inch. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that you need to measure a quarter of an inch in no. and place each pin. But eyeball as close as you can to get that quarter inch. And it will give you a lot more precision. In a similar, um, in a similar vein, when you are sewing rows together you want to anchor at the intersections because if you want points to match, you've got to put your pin through those intersections. So I found this, um, uh, I guess I'd call it a remnant, uh, remnant few blocks. Can you hold that other end, please? Or from Marquis. Yes, and this was from Marquis from our um, Modern Quilt Workshop. Many right? years ago. Yeah, but if you look, actually, let me turn it over. Can you see where the intersection of those blocks is? Right, oops, right there. Yeah, that's the point through there. And actually there's like a 
because we press our seams open, you can actually see it really well. Um, what you want to do is make sure that that uh, intersection is really, really uh, nailed. You know, that you really, really get it. Because that's what you see. So rather than starting, if you were going to be starting to put these two rows together, um, can you hold that please? A lot of people just start at this end and then they pin one direct line. And what, I, what I'm suggesting that you do is, could you hold it up please? Um, pin here, pin here, pin here, and then put, put intermittent pins between them. But basically anchor the rows where they need to line up. Where you will see the points. Exactly, because that's how you're gonna get your points to match really precisely. And you can see how, what that does, how precise that is on the front of the, um, the piece. So, may I see, so yes. take a quick look here. Yeah. Oh, Janice says it's streaming fine in South Oak Park. <laughs> on the other side of the, uh, <laughs> the other side of town, <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so Bill is going to show you how he, the exact point that, that we would put our um, needle so through. So this has already been sewn, but can you see how the needle, and I know it's close, hard to see there, the needle is coming through right where that stitching line is going to be. So you're... I, one of the things I like about pressing seams open is you can slide the needle right between the exactly. fabrics and it makes aligning points simpler. Um, but you can well, still use that same technique even if you're a press to the side. Presser, presser to the side person. Absolutely. Okay, um, tip um, six <laughs> is stacking pieces and keeping things flat. Oh yeah. Now, I, when I first started quilting, I actually, before I started quilting, I was in a home of somebody who had a bunch of squares that she had pieced into rows and they were hanging on a hanger on a door in her house and they looked beautiful. Yeah. And then when I started quilting a couple of years later, I remember thinking, oh, I'm going to hang up my rows because then <laughs> I can pretty. sort of, I could admire them and then. And you have a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. You see what you've done. But, but, but <laughs> then as soon as I put those rows down to sew, I realized that they had um, stretched. They were, you know, like two and a half inch rows. There's some serious weight to those. Oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. And then also sometimes I see, when I see pictures, either online or um, in workshops, I've, I see people who are, are having fun and they like the excitement and they're throwing fabric around everywhere. And um, mm -hmm. I, you know, if that works for them, that's great. Yes. I find it easier to keep like this, Bill actually did this, but uh, like this is the binding, it's all folded up. It's got chalk written on it and a pin through it, and it, it lives. This is a project, this is a quilt in progress. It lives in uh, a little basket while we're Very neatly it up. stacked. All the cutting is here flat. So it's kind of like if you watch the baking show. There are the bakers yes. where there's flour everywhere. Yeah. And there are others who look like they're working in a professional pastry um, a patisserie that, that where they've got everything perfectly orderly. Obviously, everyone's different, but we do find that if you store things, especially because quilts, unlike making cookies, you often do a quilt at multiple sittings. And you may not have days. That, more of that fabric. fabric. It isn't just a bag of flour you can go get. You right. Know? So keeping it tidy avoids stretching, avoids creasing, avoids wrinkling. I think, and though, it, the bigger thing is it, it, it minimizes mistakes. And, you know, what I did with this particular quilt is this is a scrappy quilt. And um, we needed one large square and then two small rectangles for this pattern. 
and, and these are the templates she cut so out. So I just, just cut this out. This is super simple from uh, cardboard to use under the ruler to expedite my cutting and to remind myself that I need two of these and one of these because the phone like, would ring and then cut one. Yeah, I just write cut on one, it. and then I would put this underneath my ruler as I was cutting, so I didn't even have to pay attention to exactly what the, the measurement was. I could just line it up when um, when I was ready to cut. Yeah. So um, I find it easier to, I think like <laughs> you, like Bill writes on this seven and a quarter inches because there's a couple of different sizes in this particular okay. project. And I'll talk about this, oh, it's a small piece. <laughs> Very small Tiny piece. piece. <laughs> School board chalk inexpensive white school board chalk. Yeah. I find that Taylor's chalk is hard. It can be a little waxy and it doesn't wash out that easily. Uh, plus it's kind of expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, yeah. Uh, whereas a 50 cent box or a dollar box of school board chalk, I don't think it's called school board chalk anymore. There is no school board chalk. It's all like just Oh, maybe, chalk. because I guess there are now like coffee shops and stuff. Yes. Have, you can have uh, chalk but, boards, yeah. But colored chalk, I would avoid because some of the pigments will really stain. So this works great on just about everything but white or yeah. light yellow, um, in which case you have, we have to come used, up. We have used colored. We have used yeah. colored chalk, but... In general, white school board chalk washes out very, very easily and is, you know, one box will last you a lifetime of quilting. So tip number seven is don't cut all of your, if you're making a scrappy quilt, don't cut all of your blocks at one time. Because what you might find is that when you're laying out the quilt that you have colors that are appearing in a row, or you need a different fabric in a different location. And if you've pre-cut all of your fabric and pre-made all of your blocks, you don't have the ability to customize what block goes where. So um, what I like to do is make 75% of the blocks and leave the cut pieces to the side because you might need a specific combination in a specific location. You can so, customize your last 25% yeah. as needed for the layout. Bill likes to make more blocks. It drives her crazy. It does, because I'm, I'm like, just like, I, I, I feel like rather than customize 25%, which to me is mentally tiring at the end of the day, I'd rather make an extra 10% and just figure out which ones work and the but what others, if they don't work? Yeah, they won't yeah. Work. so this is so, this is so there are two different approaches. Yeah. I I love sewing, so I don't mind making some extras. I don't feel bad about it, but the reality is, like, what she does is more efficient with fabric. It's probably more In efficient time. with time. Yeah, it just depends on what you like. Yeah, exactly. So be sure to add your questions in the chat if there's something about piecing you'd like a question you have um, that we can address. Um, so, and then, so then the, the, uh, the cardboard templates, that was number eight. So if you are, oh, that was, there we go. This isn't necessarily even for cutting. It's just for helping you visualize if you have a lot of different size pieces. Um, I get sometimes, I have a lot of interruptions in my day. Now I'm going to grab another thing related okay. to that. And I find that, um, if I get a phone call and or I get two phone calls in a row, then I go back and I'm like, wait a minute, how many of these was I cutting? And I just find it easier to have some kind of visual device to help me remember exactly how much, how many of each piece I'm cutting. And that's uh, just, you know, cheap scrap cardboard. Um, we like to press after every seam. I find it so much easier to uh, keep things flat and consistent if I press after every seam. If it's a long row, like when I was <clears throat> doing this piece, um, I might press, if, if they're, you know, if I was doing two seams that were six or eight inches apart, 
Maybe I would um, not do every single seam. I'd wait until do it two or three at a time. But um, the it really it's really helpful to be able to keep um, everything flat to press after every seam. Oh, and um, Anne wants to know if the extras show up on the back. Sometimes they do, but oh, sometimes often. they don't. Yeah. Like with that quilt over there that we're, we'll show you uh, in January. Um, I don't think we didn't put the uh, the quilts. Um, the extras on the back. The extras on the back. Yeah. So, Christine, do we press with steam? Oh, once again, this is a little sensitive because there are two of us here. Yes. It's, we, con it, it, it's just, a British, it's, it's, it's controversy. There's yes. a controversy. <laughs> so if Weeks has been the last one to use the iron, the steam is always on. If I was the last one, the steam is off. I use the burst of steam feature. So I do press with steam, but I never leave it on. I just burst as needed. And Weeks leaves it on all the time. And I actually partly attribute that to the fact that I always wear glasses and steam steams them up. But also because we press open, I often nudge, I start pressing uh, seam open with my finger and follow it and I just don't want to burn myself. Some people worry that the steam stretches the fabric more. I, I just haven't had that experience. So um, again, figure out what works for you it also has to do with the quality of your iron steam. Uh, if, if you have good steam, you're more likely to use it and not all irons are the same at all. So <clears throat> Pam had an interesting comment that she wishes more patterns gave the sizes as you go along. And I think the challenge with that is that people um, make quilts differently and that we know a well-known quilting instructor, for example, who never pieces in rows. Even if the pattern says to piece in rows, she says that she can visually see that that, that big crease bothers her. And so she uh, does kind of chunks. chunks. So she'll do groups of four um, and then, you know, four and four and then you Maybe know eight and right just... so she intentionally doesn't do big rows so um i i do think though if it's a if it's a block you should be able to um s calculate that well and i i'll even jump in some people will call us and say they're working on a pattern but it doesn't say the size of the finished block and some patterns always say the block is eight and a half inches square. Others don't say anything. And this, it's actually a really good, good thing to discuss. Because it is a great topic. For me, when we give the sizes of all the pieced uh, or all the cut units and we say sew it together, in theory, Everyone will sew the same size block, but we know that people have different mm -hmm. seam allowances. And what I've found is there are a lot of quilters who have decided, and eh, they're not gonna worry about precision. They're gonna put it all together and trim down every block. Mm -hmm. And that's why they want to know the finished size so they can trim their blocks. Our approach has been more Take your time making the block so that it is the right size and you don't have to trim it down because I guess kind of in our minds, trimming it is an unnecessary step. If, if it's sewn carefully to begin with, there's no need to trim it. You know, I think the bigger thing it, it's, is it's that up to you. I think it is that if you're not a pattern writer, you don't really realize how much we are working around, and I know that not everybody does this, but we do, we're not giving you sizes that aren't on, aren't on your rulers. So, you know, sometimes in order, especially with triangles, we find that if you are, um, uh, sometimes in order for you to cut, if we're telling you to cut a Template. an eight inch, Oh. A eight inch square at an angle, you know, then the 
That hypotenuse will give you a very odd finished size block sometimes. Right, and you don't want, it's kind of like you have to choose whether you're gonna give people, sometimes, actually often it seems to me, you have to choose whether you're gonna give somebody an easy to cut size or a finished size that's- Within a that's quarter inch increment. Yeah, within a quarter inch increment, but people don't want us to give them, oh, it'll be eight and five sixteenths. Yeah, you know, they this don't, is a really that, good point. As this soon is as you not, have it, it sounds like it would be really easy for and, us to do that, but if you haven't written patterns, but, you've uh, got to make, you've got to choose how many, you've got to make it efficient for the, for in quarter yard increments. And efficient in quarter inch seam allowance. And the 40 inch width. So, and we're, so we're if, thinking about the engineering to make it pleasant to make. So yeah. Weeks's point is that not all blocks end up in a block quilt, end up being in port, perfect quarter inch increments. The other thing is, I, you know, we like curves, we like diagonals. There are a lot of quilts that involve triangles that in order to get around all this math, mm -hmm. you have to buy a special ruler. Right. And I'm not a fan of that. I, well, I we, would rather, we, we do sell special rulers. Not for, not for diagonals, not for triangles. Oh, that's true. That's true. That's we true. did yeah. for curves because yeah. that's different. You can't draft a curve easily. Right. But um, a lot of people have special triangle rulers. And I just, I like to minimize the amount of stuff. So, yeah, Weeks's point is very good that many of our blocks don't have really crisp quarter inch measurements in the end so in we the, don't in the finished them seams in the finished block. yeah and so i think when um for this the school of people who want to make things big and then trim them down um i i think you're you're setting up a problem for yourself because quilt the math doesn't work out that way yeah, with many be. you know i mean and and if if you are calling me or, or emailing me because you want to know what the finished size of the block is, it's because there's an angle involved and it's not a quarter inch increment. That's most likely so. Because if it were, you'd be able to figure it out yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'd be able to look at the pattern and say, oh, okay, it's a five inch block and, you know, it'll be a four and a half inch, it's a five inch square and it'll be a four and a half inch finished square and... Yeah. You know, it would be obvious. Easy. Right. So, so that's the, that is the challenge. But going back up to, Barbara, your question, asking whether we spray our fabric with starch. We are not big starch users. Um, there are a few exceptions. In general, we always press our fabrics as nicely as we can before cutting. There are a couple exceptions. And when we do use starch, we use the... Um, so we don't use starch. We well, it's... Best press. Best yeah. press. Mary Ellen's um, best press, which mm -hmm. is a starch alternative. And that, I think, is most useful for intricate cutting, detail work, or curves. But I would say that 99.9% um, .9 of the time, we don't use that. I think I use starch or... Mary Ellen's best press more if I'm doing garment sewing, I think. Yeah. Actually, I think for me, I use uh, Mary Ellen's best press um, when I'm doing uh, binding with yarn dyes. I think yarn dyes is the time that I use the most. It stabilizes them a bit. Yeah, because um, they're they're just a little bit looser than, uh, than prints, as we've discussed before. So, um, but... We have, uh, we do not go through even a bottle a year. Oh, and I, so I see the comment, when will we use the metric system? Oh my gosh, you're, you're, you're speaking to me. I love the metric system. Oh, you did not like it though when you, but, when we did books and you had to translate all of, we did, we did European books and it was, oh. We've done a couple, but one book that we did long ago, the Modern Quote Workshop, we had 
15 quilts, I think, 15 <sighs> patterns. We did each one in four sizes. And I did the math, so that was 60 patterns, and I did them all in US and metric because it was sold throughout the world. That's insane. And what's interesting is it's not just a conversion. You actually resize all the pieces to work nicely. And we've also written a lot of patterns for French and Japanese magazines. And mm -hmm. when we do that, we do it all in the metric system. I love the metric system. It makes so much more sense. Um, but it's not, uh, you but know. But it's not the yeah. standard in the States, so. Yeah, um, and there was a question I didn't want to um, get past. Someone was asking, how do you not avoid, how do you avoid sewing over pins? And I've got a really great um, tip for that, which is you keep the pin in until it's, you get right before, uh, I'd say within an inch of the needle, or even a half an inch of the needle. Quarter inch. <laughs> yeah, put your needle down um, and then take out the, the pin. So at that point, it can't go anywhere. Um, do really do not sew over needles. And I know people do it all the time and they joke about it, but I accidentally did it once over and pins, yeah. over pins. And I happened to be wearing glasses at the time and the pin actually scratched my glass when it flew into my face lens, yeah. onto the lens. And um, so really do not mess Please, around don't, with that. Don't yeah. sew over pins. The other thing is if, if you are sewing and your needle for some reason does strike a pin in general it's one of the reasons i like like the clover flower head pins mm -hmm. one of the things i like about them is they are thinner than the sewing needle so in a war when they hit right. this will bend more often than breaking the needle if you use, say, a heavier, more traditional glass head pin, most of these have a thicker actual pin and are more likely, because they're more rigid, they're harder, they're thicker, it's more likely to break the needle than a thin um, flower head pin. Disadvantage of these is they bend more easily, the heads occasionally fall off, um, I think the glass head pins will probably last you a lifetime, whereas the flower head pins, every couple of years we yeah. retire a bunch of them. Yeah. They just wear out. And because they're thinner, you tend to get blunted tips that can snag fabric. And so, yeah, these don't... You have to replace them. You have to replace them. They don't last as long, but they're less likely to break your needle if you do sew into it. The other thing that's nice is with this flower head, you can um, write numbers to mark rows for assembly. Um, and that is a great trick I've seen people do before too. Yeah. Okay, um, and then let's see. So, and then we've discussed uh, the pressing after every seam. And then um, the last, the tip number 10, and this is, I think this is a really undervalued tip, which is check your narrative. And what I mean by that is uh, while you're sewing, check what's going on in your head because that will affect how well your quilting is going on and, and how easy it is and how fun it is. And um, I have been in the situation where it's one o'clock in the morning and uh, I've got to get a quilt ready for a baby shower the next day or usually photo shoot or more, more likely a photo shoot or something and you're stressed and you make silly ridiculous mistakes that are time consuming to fix and you know there's there, the science of it is that you're you use a different part of your brain and your amygdala gets engaged and suddenly the reasoning um, that you have in your brain is suddenly out the window and you are, you're not able to problem solve, you're not able to focus, you're, you're just, um, uh, you're gonna make mistakes and you're, or you're gonna hurt yourself. So that's another thing that happens. So as you are sewing, um, you know, be mindful as to whether or not 
Are you feeling anxious that you're not gonna do, that this technique is frustrating? Like check in with yourself because it really is the, the mental part of this is significant. And I've, I've seen people even within the same classroom having a great time and being really relaxed. And then other people who have some kind of narrative that's going on in their brain that they can't do it or that well, they didn't bring the right fabrics or that there's something going on at home that's preoccupying them. Uh, and it really affects your work. Maybe two weeks ago, we were working late <laughs> and the narrative in my mind was, I am going to get this quilt top pieced. I was so focused. We were actually away. So we weren't working in our studio. And I was so determined. I had cranked out a ton of blocks. I was so proud. I, I, I was almost done. And I just needed to get this one more row done. And the narrative wasn't make a great quilt. It was get this done. Yeah. And I put it all together and I, I said to Weeks, yay, done. And I laid it out and I realized I'd sewn one of the rows upside down. I was so focused that, and I was up close. I didn't yeah. step away and I sewed it upside down and I was so mad at myself for two reasons. One, I was happy that I was done and I wasn't done. And two, because we weren't at home, we didn't have our good seam ripper. Yeah. And I had to take the seam out with a horrible but seam ripper. I took ripper. it out for you. Yes, I this did. Is where we sort of have, we have, <laughs> we have a studio we have a rule. rule that if somebody has to have a seam ripped out, the other one rips out the seam because it's bad enough. You, you kick yourself enough um, that it's just kind of like a little act of grace. It's an act of grace. So, <laughs> do say, so I'll rip it out. Don't send you. us your seams. <laughs> We're not going to do it for you. Although when, you, when I used to do oh, in, teaching, in we did all the classing, time. I would always rip out people's seam for them. So, the aunt says nothing is going on in her head when she's sitting at her machine. That's, oh, great. that's great. That's great. I actually feel You're that, fortunate that I you feel can that way often. Compartmentalize oh, and that I, way. I do want to really quickly go back because... Um, Caroline asked about using Tyrell Magic in place of Best Press, and I will say I have never used that because I don't even know what it is. So you're teaching I, me something I have, new. I've I have never heard, heard of it, it and um, but we we like Best Press and we have a good supply of it. So, so but that's good to know. I, I I love knowing of new things, and now you know it's like when you hear of it, you'll see it and yeah. and try it out. So those are our 10 tips. And um, I think we got to all your questions. If we missed any, um, put them in there so um, we can, uh, we can I, get to them before we, um, we wrap up here. I, I definitely like Weeks' idea of like, check that narrative. If you can be totally relaxed and just sewing, that's, that's wonderful. Um, that's where I like to be when I sew. But I, if you're I, but not. It's, it's not always the case. If you're not, stop. Uh, take a breath, get a cup of tea, um, use the Calm app or do whatever you need to um, get yourself, to remind yourself that this is supposed to be fun and that you, mm -hmm. with patience, you can learn, you can fix the mistake, you can uh, ask a friend for help, um, but uh, we want you to have fun doing it and to not feel not have self-imposed pressure. So, And I think one of the really nice things about this world of cell phones and social media is if you're working hard on something, even when you're not done, you've just pieced a bunch of bros, you can take a picture and just text a friend or put it online just to get a pat on the back. Yes, exactly. Like, at all times, it's, it's, quilting is not instant gratification. There are so many steps, so don't be, I, I think a lot of people feel like you don't show the work till it's done. Oh, the no. Whole, the, I know that that's not the case online, but there is a real tradition at, at um, Guild of show and tell is about what is finished. Well, and I think it, since Anne's on here from Sweden, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give her a great shout out. She's part of our Modern yeah. Guild Studio um, Fabrics and Patterns group and she showed progress getting her accordion quilt her beautiful accordion with quilt with great colors and you know she was saying like oh i can't believe take i can't believe i haven't finished this yet and there have been other um other of our quilting friends who've shown um portions of our patterns like um 
uh, are um, uh, just forgetting on the cover of issue 14. Oh, lavish. Uh, uh, our lavish quilt. Um, you know, that it, some quilts take longer uh, than others and, you know, pace yourself um, because it, it's, it's easy to just kind of uh, feel, have a self-imposed sense of pressure that you don't need to have because we want you to have fun. It's a balancing act, Christine. Like, I'm glad you like that we talk about accuracy, but it is a fine line. I think awareness matters. Trying to be aware of the quarter inch, but right. not necessarily, you know, I was in a retreat where one of the quilting instructors went around and measured every single person's oh, seam allowance goodness. and called them out if it oh, wasn't accurate. Goodness. And I was like, oh man, that's just not for me. To me, it's about self-awareness and aiming for betterment and enjoyment. And I, think, and I think I have also seen the opposite, which is people who have gone to um, workshops where rulers were not allowed and they came to like, you know, the quilt group meeting with a whole bunch of, you know, quilt tops that weren't flat and, and were, were really frustrated. frustrated, you know, that it just didn't work. So um, I will give one more since it's, uh, since it is the season. Oh, oh. Our Warp and Weft holiday line, if you haven't seen it, this is the fat quarter um, bundle, but we also have lots of yardage. Um, we, you know, fabric lines aren't around for very long. Um, however, because this line um, is kind of an evergreen line, if you, if you combine fabrics in a Christmas palette, it will look like a Christmas quilt. But um, the Hanukkah blue and the red and white um, fabrics together make the patriotic like spirit quilt and other things. So we'll have these for as long as... Um, Actually, this is the last bundle. We've got a bunch more coming yeah. next week. So. And, and we, we have some we can make too, yes. um, if need be. But um, be sure to get yardage while we have it. Um, because some of these, uh, yeah. the lines sell out pretty quickly. They do. And we'll have a new line uh, to show to you in Coming January. Soon. We just made some quilts with it. We so, just got our yardage. Yeah, and we're so. finishing up Modern Quilts Illustrated 15. Yeah, and, doing um, some photo shoots. And yeah, we, so, will, we will probably see you. I'll probably, I'm going to be posting a video about um, a class that uh, we're going to be, uh, I think I'm going to be doing um, next year uh, to start off the new year, but we'll right. see you a little bit before then. But for, for uh, Quilts First, we will see you again on January 1st and hope that you enjoy spending oh. some time with us then. Okay, take, take care, care, everyone.